Sandeep, tell me when to start. Uh, I guess we can, yeah, people are coming. Maybe let's wait one more minute. We can start now. Is, he, is, he, is the speaker back? I don't see him here. No, he's there. He's there. there okay. <laughs> Some of the screen doesn't show him. Okay, so let's start. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Professor Alexandre Tutier speaking to us today. So let me just quickly uh, give a little background about him. He got his uh, PhD in applied math from Ecole Polytechnic. Of after uh, getting a math degree from Ecole Normale Superior, in addition to engineer degree, in degrees from Telecom Paris and Côte de Mines, and worked um, with Microsoft Research and uh, France Telecom before joining KTH. And uh, during his um, stay at France Telecom, he was also affiliated with ENS Paris. He has already done a lot of work in wireless communications and he, he, he was recognized by ACM Sigmetrix Rising Star Award in 2009, in addition to getting Best Paper Awards from Sigmetrix in 2004 and 2010 and from Moby Hawk in 2009. And more recently has been work, uh, diversifying into several other areas, particularly multi-arm bandits and as you see from the title today, system identification and so on. So let, let us welcome Professor Tutie and uh, uh, talk about fastest identification in linear systems. Okay, over to you, Professor. Thank you very much for the introduction and for uh, the invitation. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. You see me uh, as well? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Very good. So uh, thank you again for the invitation. It's a very uh, interesting and nice workshop. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, statistical inference in linear system. And I will report some recent results that have been uh, mainly derived by Yassir Jedra, who is actually in the Zoom room. Um, so you can, I guess, uh, chat with him during the talk if you like. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so, so let's start. Um, so um, the talk is about learning in linear system with uh, what I have in mind is applications in reinforcement learning. identification of, of systems uh, with an underlying linear structure. So what do I mean by linear structure? Uh, the first part of the talk, I will talk about uh, systems with linear rewards. So it's an online control problem where the reward that you collect is a linear function of the action that you select. So uh, the first part will be devoted to a linear, so-called linear bandit optimization, where when you pick uh, an action A, uh, represented as a Euclidean vector, the, you get a sample of uh, reward of average A transpose mu. Yes? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, yes sir. We can hear you, sir. Yes. Uh, sorry, sorry. So uh, you get a, a sample of uh, reward of average A transpose mu, where mu is unknown. So this uh, linear bandit optimization and, uh, and have been extremely popular to model a recommender system and in any system using kind of matrix factorization. Another example of uh, linear structure in the rewards have been mentioned by Professor Wang in her talk the first day of the workshop. It's about learning in Markov decision processes with so-called linear function approximation. And in this case, the value function of the MDP is just uh, can be expressed as a linear function uh, with, of course, an uh, unknown coefficients mu. So in the, in the first part, the goal is really to devise uh, an efficient sequential action selection strategy to either estimate mu, the unknown parameter uh, dictating the reward, or directly to estimate the best arm, the best action, or the best policy in uh, MDPs. In the second part of the talk, uh, um, 
I will talk about uh, linear structure, but uh, concerning uh, dynamics. So I will uh, revisit uh, system identification in the classical uh, control uh, in the cl classical control framework, where the state of the system at time t plus one is just a linear function of the current state at time t x t, so a x t plus, of course, some kind of control action plus noise. And uh, the goal here is really like uh, any system identification uh, problem is to devise a, a, an efficient method to estimate the system. So to estimate A or B. All right. So uh, these two problems may seem very, very simple and actually classical. And, and you might think that everything has been uh, said about these problems. Uh, actually, they have attracted a lot of research interest uh, over the last couple of years, and for good reasons. Uh, they are actually very challenging to say, uh, to say things about these systems. Uh, for both parts, for both problems, uh, actually, we will require the analysis of uh, random matrices that are built uh, from uh, dynamical systems. So as a consequence, these random matrices, they don't have uh, independent entries, but uh, they are rather uh, correlated, and this correlation comes from the dynamical system. Um, so the, the, the random metrics that we are interested in both parts is what we call the covariates metrics, and we will try to derive concentration result for this matrix, and this will be the main ingredient of any analysis for uh, both parts of the, of the talk. Uh, part one uh, uh, requires us to devise efficient uh, action selection strategy, uh, stopping rule, and, and so um, it, it will require us to combine and jointly analyze several ingredients, uh, ingredients from a random matrix theory, uh, stopping, uh, stopping rules, and uh, sequential selection st uh, strategies. All right. So before I start, I would like to make a, a remark that is, I, I believe, interesting, and uh, that is uh, will justify what kind of performance metrics or what kind of guarantees we are after in this talk. So in the learning community, in the machine learning community, you have two kinds of guarantees. Uh, most often, people are interested in minimax guarantees. Uh, essentially, I think it's because uh, machine learning is, uh, let's say, at the intersection of computer science and statistics, and historically, minimax approach have been uh, the ones that prevail. Okay, uh, I will try to, uh, uh, to to make you understand that this approach is not appropriate uh, in general for uh, for our learning tasks. Uh, the second approach that I will try to have here is called instance specific. So it means that we try to have performance guarantees of our algorithm for a given model or a given system phi. Uh, and um, we want to be optimal for this given model. So we don't want to be uh, optimal in the minimax sense, but uh, in an instance specific sense. So you can uh, illustrate the difference between the minimax and the instance specific approach uh, using this little picture. So I just put uh, on the x axis the set of systems you could have, okay? So in the for example in the in the linear bandit case it would be the, para, the the vector mu that we we represent in the x axis. And on the y-axis, I represent, let's say, the probability of error when you return the maximum, the best arm. Okay. So a minimax approach is to uh, look at algorithms that performs uh, no worse, not worse than uh, what you can do in the worst case for all the worst system. So you take uh, the instance-specific uh, lower bound of the error. So of course, depending on the model, this error might be huge or small. Uh, some, some models are very easy to learn. Some models are more difficult to learn. Uh, the minimax approach takes the worst possible model and uh, takes that as a benchmark. 
On the other hand, so it's, it's rather easy to derive algorithms with minimax uh, optimality because the performance guarantee is actually very weak. Actually, uh, in most cases, the minimax lower bounds come from very wacky examples and they are often meaningless. That's my uh, point of view. So uh, another way of uh, saying uh, or, or criticizing minimax approach is to say that minimax guarantee are just stating that an algorithm performs okay in the worst possible system, but it does not say whether the algorithm learns and adapts to the systems. So you see that if you have a system with low possible error, uh, your minimax optimal algorithm would have a performance that is very, very far from being optimal. So to further illustrate the, the problem of minimax approach, you can look at the, the, the problem of best arm identification and looking at what is the sample complexity of best arm identification. So best arm identification is, is, uh, is the problem where you have K actions that are completely unrelated uh, with stochastic rewards. These rewards are parameterized by some distribution phi, okay? And uh, a learning algorithm uh, consists in selecting round after round an arm, observing the corresponding reward. After a while, you think that you gathered enough uh, information, so you stop in round tau. And in this round, you output an action A tau that you believe is optimal. So you can uh, try to be delta pack. So in, in the sense that the probability of uh, making an error is, is smaller than delta for a given uh, confidence delta, or you can be epsilon delta pack, uh, meaning that your algorithm is returning an epsilon optimal uh, arm or action with probability bigger than one minus delta. So here is the, is the table of uh, the minimax lower bound, the fundamental limits in the minimax sense and the instance specific sense for delta pack and epsilon delta pack algorithm. And uh, so you see, even for the delta pack, uh, there is no minimax lower bound. Actually, it's not possible to have a delta pack algorithm, whatever the model is, okay. Uh, on the other hand, it's possible to have an epsilon delta pack uh, algorithm in the minimax sense. Um, Delta pack algorithm, of course, when you look at instance specific lower bounds, they exist uh, most of the case. It's just that if you take the supremum over the model phi of the C1 of phi, it's infinite. That's why you don't have a minimax lower bound. Uh, this is a fortunate case for epsilon delta pack because uh, you can see that actually. Um, the minimax lower bound and the instant specific lower bound scale more or less uh, similarly as a function of epsilon and delta. But this is not always the case. And remember that here, uh, even uh, minimax approach is often not possible. A more striking example where uh, the minimax approach is really failing and causing a lot of confusion in the community is when you look at the regret in reinforcement learning. This is, the, this is what uh, Professor Wong talks about in uh, her talk in the first day of the workshop. So here you consider an ergodic uh, tabular Markov decision process with S state and A action. And initially you don't know the transition probability and you don't know the reward function. And you have an algorithm that is learning this and trying to do uh, as well as possible. At time t, uh, after t, capital T observation, you can look at the regret of your algorithm by comparing the average reward of an optimal policy. If the policy knows at time zero what, are the, what is the best policy, minus the average reward that you collect using your algorithm. And for this particular uh, reinforcement learning problem, there is a regret uh, lower bound in the minimax and in the instance specific sense. Uh, the regret, uh, the lower bound for, minim for minimax approach is scaling as square root of SAT, uh, whereas the instance specific lower bound scale as uh, a constant that depends on the model, 
on the MDP considered times log t. So you see that here there is a different scaling in the time horizon, log t versus square root of t. Uh, but uh, actually, there is something that you should know is that the minimax, I, I said uh, that the minimax lower bound or minimax approach is often based on very wacky example. And this is the case here because the minimax systems, the one that is leading to the lower bound, actually depends on the time horizon t. So it means that the transition probabilities are tuned so that they depend on the time horizon. This is very weird example. Uh, so you see that uh, you can have an algorithm that is minimax optimal, but very far from being instance specific optimal. And uh, as a matter of fact, so uh, I remember uh, uh, in, the, in one of the slides of Professor Wong, there, there was this, uh, she was citing this paper by Jing, Alan Zhu, Bubeck, and Jordan in Europe's uh, 2018. And the paper is entitled, Is Q-Learning Probably Efficient? And the answer in this paper was, yes, it's efficient because it has a regret scaling as the minimax lower bound. So this is a very strong misconception because uh, this is just the, uh, the, the minimax uh, guarantee. And it's, uh, essentially based on a very, very wacky uh, benchmark, okay. Um, what is even more striking, I think the killing argument is, is that actually a regret of square root of SAT is more a regret that you would be able to obtain in an adversarial scenario. And this, this has been shown uh, in a paper by Abbas et al. in 2013, where they show that you can have a regret of square root of SAT even if the MDP, even if the model is changing every single step. So you understand that having a, a, a guarantee of square root SAT has nothing to do with statistics. It has to do with kind of adapting to the worst case and even an adversarial worst case. So if you are smart and if you are uh, really trying to learn the system statistically, you can do much better. So it's not because Q-learning has a regret of square root SAT that it's a good algorithm. There must be something else. Uh, why people look at this regret is because it's easy to derive because the bound is so high. All right, so I hope you understand that uh, in this talk, I will be only focusing on um, an instance specific approach. So I will fix the system and I try to derive a performance lower bound for this particular system, and I will try to achieve the best possible for this particular system. All right. So uh, let's start with best arm identification in linear systems. So this is linear system with a linear reward structure. So um, you have a set of arms of action, <coughs> Cal A, uh, that, is, uh, include, that is a subset of R to the power D. Uh, a is a set of fin is finite number of action, or it could be continuous. I will start uh, discussing the finite case and talk about the continuous case later on. So uh, the game is as follows. In, in each round, uh, the decision maker select an arm A of T. And he gets, as a, as a feedback of the system, he gets a sample of the reward that is of average mu transpose a t. Okay. So the reward at time t for an action a is r t of a, which is mu transpose a plus eta t, where eta t are supposed to be iid and Gaussian with uh, variance uh, sigma. Okay. What is unknown here is the the, the, the vector mu that is uh, essentially defining the average reward. So uh, here the goal is to identify the best possible arm and we will uh, consider the fixed confidence setting where we wish to design a sequential arm selection strategy, AT, a stopping rule tau, so we are going to stop at some round tau, and a decision rule uh, A hat tau, this is the or estimated best arm. 
and uh, we want to design such uh, such uh, components such that uh, with uh, with a fixed level of confidence we return the best arm uh, and with of course a minimal sample complexity that is here defined as the expected number of rounds uh, before you stop exploring before you stop uh, interacting with the system uh, for the notion of confidence, uh, we use the delta pack framework <clears throat> when, the, when we have a finite number of arms. So it means that we want to return the best arm with probability uh, uh, bigger than one minus delta. For uh, when we have a continuous set of actions, we, we are obliged to move to epsilon delta pack algorithm. Uh, in which case we want to return an epsilon optimal arm uh, with probability uh, one minus delta at least. Okay. All right. So uh, what what is known about this problem? Uh, uh, so essentially, linear bandits were, were were introduced by our Peter Hour in two thousand three. Uh, there was. A, first exhaustive study in terms of regret by Danny Eyes and Kakade in 2008. And then uh, the interest in this kind of system grew up uh, since um, the, the paper by Lee, Shu, Longfort and Shapir in 2011, where they uh, managed to uh, model a recommender system using this kind of uh, linear uh, bandits. When it comes to best arm identification in linear bandits, there are uh, only a few papers, let's say here are six papers. Um, and it's the, the literature started by Soar, Lazaric, and Munoz in 2013. Um, when we did our analysis, the, the state of the art algorithm was called RAGE uh, by Fizz, Jen, Jamison, and Ratliff. Uh, it was based, uh, most of the algorithm actually are based on successive elimination. So it means that uh, the algorithm proceeds in phases. And at the end of each phase, you remove some arms that you believe are, won't be optimal. Um, actually, uh, because of this uh, structure, uh, it's very difficult to prove that these algorithms are optimal. And, and they are probably uh, suboptimal in terms of sample complexity. Um, yes. All right. So. Um, what, uh, what we wish to, to, to achieve uh, is to devise an algorithm that, is, uh, op uh, that has an optimal sample complexity, both in an almost sure uh, uh, case and in expectation. So uh, most of the analysis uh, in, the, um, in the related work concern uh, but not in expectation. Having guarantees in expectation is more difficult to achieve, and it's also necessary because uh, somehow, as I will show, uh, the sample complexity lower bounds that we have are in expectation, and they are not with high probability. Uh, so we want to devise an algorithm with optimal sample complexity uh, that is easy to implement. There is no phases. There is absolutely no doubling trick. Okay. Um, and uh, importantly, we want the algorithm to scale. Uh, so we, we want that its implementation and, and, and performance does not depend on the number of arms K. Okay, and uh, to this aim, we will exploit uh, Gary V. Kaufman's approach for the, that has been developed for, to, to handle classical bandit problems and we we extend and we, tra we, we translate these techniques to the linear um, structure real. So as I told you, the first thing we do is uh, we have an instance specific approach and our approach would be to fix the model. So I, I fix the mu. I want to find the best possible uh, sample complexity for a given mu achieved by any delta pack algorithm. Okay, so I will derive a fundamental limit, a lower bound on the sample complexity, and then I will devise an algorithm that reach this level of sample complexity. 
So to, uh, to, to derive a sample complexity lower bound, uh, we uh, exploit the very famous change of measure argument uh, developed by Lai and Robbins uh, in 85, actually, for initial, uh, initially for the, the regret in uh, bandit, uh, bandit problems. And we uh, use it for best arm identification and uh, with the, this linear structure. So uh, the change of measure argument and the data processing inequality consists in looking at the expected log likelihood ratio of the observation up to round t, so that denoted by OT. Uh, given that we uh, the, the ratio of the probability of this observation uh, with, when they are generated with uh, when the system as is depicted is de described sorry by a vector mu. Um, and uh, when it's described by another vector lambda. And the uh, data processing inequality says that the expected log likelihood ratio is bigger than the KL divergence between two Bernoulli distribution of average uh, <coughs> P mu of E and P lambda of E, where E is an event that is uh, Cal FT measurable. Okay, so it depends on the it's a function of the T first observations. So what is nice with the linear structure is that we can actually uh, explicitly uh, write what this uh, expected log likelihood ratio is. And this is written like this. This is mu minus lambda transpose times the expected covariate matrix times mu minus lambda. Hello, can, can I interrupt you? There are a couple of questions already. Of course, yes. Yeah, so first is from Sandeep Juneja. So is, uh, the question is, so is Q learning known to be provably efficient in the instant specific sense? Absolutely not. It is, it is not efficient in the, uh, no. There is no, there is no proof and I, I, would, I would guess it is not. The second uh, is, the, well, you know, so Q learning as a, um, so, why do I say that? Is because essentially Q learning is a stochastic approximation method, and uh, there have been results about what is the learning rate of stochastic approximation, and uh, the stochastic approximation methods are. Um, I don't think they can achieve a log t regret, for example. That's my personal opinion, but maybe you, Vivek, you, you know more about this. <laughs> no, unfortunately, I don't. Uh, okay, the second question is from Siddharth. It says, what is unknown in the instance specific case? Uh, in the instance specific case, it's the instance itself that is not known. So for example, here, uh, we, an instance is, is just uh, what we, is, is the model. So here, is defined by the vector mu. So what we don't know initially is the, is the vector mu. Instance specific means that I fix mu, I don't know it, but I want uh, that the, my algorithm is achieving the best possible performance for this given mu. So in, in other words, uh, if, uh, if, um, if I choose mu prime, I want my algorithms to be optimal for this mu prime. If I choose mu, I want my algorithms to adapt to this other mu and, and be optimal as well. That's why uh, we call it instance specific. <coughs> it, has a, um, it has a performance that is specific to the parameter of the systems. Okay, so the instance here is mu and what is not known is the instance itself, mu. Yeah, those were the only questions. Okay. All right, so I was uh, deriving the instance specific sample complexity lower bound. <coughs> and um, so I told you it's very convenient in this case because the expected log likelihood ratio as an explicit formula as a function of the expected covariate matrix. And uh, so, if I take uh, an event that you are not returning the best arm under mu, a star of mu is the best possible action under mu, uh, then if I have a, a delta pack algorithm, I know that um, 
the probability uh, of this event under mu should be smaller than epsilon, so smaller than delta here. But if lambda has a different optimal arm than, uh, than mu, so in other words, if lambda is in what we call the confusing set B mu of uh, the set of parameters such that, well, uh, A star of mu is not optimal for lambda, then because the algorithm is delta pack, uh, this probability uh, under the parameter lambda of this event E should be bigger than one minus delta. Okay, that's why you go from this uh, here right hand side to the KL divergence between delta and one minus delta. Okay, and essentially <clears throat> what is nice here is that you can optimize the left hand side with respect to lambda being confusing and you get this lower bound here. So uh, the expected sample complexity is bigger than KL divergence between delta one minus delta divided by uh, this quantity here, where uh, W A is the ratio, is the proportion of time you choose action A in average, and uh, W is referred to the allocation. So uh, of course W depends on your algorithm, right? So <clears throat> uh, the lower bound is obtained by taking the best uh, algorithm, so the, the supremum over all the possible allocation. So the, the result of the previous analysis is that we have a lower bound for the, for, uh, the sample complexity of uh, delta pack algorithm um, in the linear bandit uh, case. And it's, it has been known actually, uh, it has been first derived by Soar in her thesis in 2015. And it says that uh, the expected number of rounds you should, uh, that you cannot avoid is uh, bigger than two sigma square, T star of mu, KL divergence, essentially log of one over delta. And T star of mu is given by this mean, uh, this uh, max mean uh, problem. That is actually uh, simple to, to, uh, to solve. Uh, actually, the, 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 the function involved here uh, that we call uh, psi of mu double view is actually continuous. Um, its maximum is also continuous. And um, the, the optimal allocation is uh, the optimal allocations uh, con, uh, form a convex, compact, and non-empty non set. Actually, solving this optimization problem is a convex program. All right, so um, in ba based on this uh, observation, uh, the design of an algorithm tracking an optimal allocation, so an, an allocation that would belong to C star of new might be possible. And this is what uh, our algorithm to so uh, the design principle of the, the algorithm are, are as follows. Uh, first of all, uh, there is some kind of, it, it relies on some kind of certainty equivalence principle uh, based on the least square estimator for mu. Uh, in the case of linear system, the least square estimator is uh, explicit, is a pseudo inverse of the covariate matrix times another matrix. And essentially you see that um, the, consistency and the error concentration of the least square estimator would actually be very, um, very dependent on the smallest eigenvalue of the covariate matrix. Um, the sampling rule uh, will actually ensure that this smallest eigenvalue is large enough so that we can have this uh, certainty equivalence principle and this is a component in the sampling rule that we call forced exploration. And the second component of the sampling rule is that it's going to track <coughs> the optimal allocation C star of mu by just replacing mu by its uh, least square estimators. The third component is a stopping rule, of course, and it will be based on the generalized log likelihood uh, ratio test uh, with an appropriate threshold. Uh, what is important is that we have to make all these procedures independent of the number of arms k, and that's a, that's a challenge. Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> so in the introduction, I told you that uh, we have a random matrix that we want to analyze. Uh, the random matrix here that is of interest is the covariate matrix, which is this one here. And um, the speed of growth of this matrix uh, di dictates the error of the least square estimators. Um, because actually we can have um, an explicit expression for the difference between the least square estimator and the true parameter. This is this one. And so when you look at the, the, the norm of this error, you can decompose it in, in two terms, in, including um, one where you have the square root of the covariate matrix. So, um, the first term here uh, will be actually managed using uh, concentration result in uh, self-normalized processes. Um, so refer to uh, Pena, Lai, and Shao's book for details, and also the paper by Abbasi Yadkori et al. in 2011. That was one of the first to use this um, analysis in the case of linear bending. So essentially to bound this term, we use these self-normalized processes inequalities, concentration inequalities. And uh, using this and using the fact that we can control the uh, smallest eigenvalue of the covariate matrix. So we assume here that lambda mean of the covariate matrix is bigger than C T to the power alpha, square root of T, for example. Then we can have a concentration result for the least square estimator by combining these two things. So for the sampling rule, uh, we will do uh, what we call force exploration, which uh, is uh, so that the, um, the, so that the, the smallest eigenvalue of the covariate matrix grows uh, as square root of T. And to do that, we will uh, just do a round robin uh, in a round robin, when this is necessary, we will do a round robin of actions uh, that uh, whose vectors actually span the entire RD, so that the, the lambda mean of uh, this matrix is strictly positive, positive. And when we don't need to explore, when we don't need to ensure the that the certainty equivalence principle will hold, we are going to track the allocation that is uh, optimal. So actually the, track, the, the tracking can be very lazy. We just need to track an allocation WT that uh, converge more or less uh, almost surely to C star of mu. So it's very uh, weak. There is no concentration, no speed of convergence required here. Okay, so this is the arm selection uh, strategy. Uh, when the lambda mean of the covariance metric is smaller than square root of t, we explore in a round robin manner. And when we um, don't need to explore, we track the best allocation. All right. For the stopping rule, uh, we have uh, we use a generalized log likelihood ratio, and uh, this is very classical. Uh, what is uh, not classical is the way to uh, tune the threshold. And the threshold here uh, works and it does not depend on K, on the number of arms. So that's a, a critical component of, of the algorithm. So altogether, we were able to prove the following theorem that says that the algorithm that we just uh, derived is delta pack. And uh, it has a sample complexity that asymptotically when delta goes to zero uh, is optimal. So it reached the lower bound for any mu, any possible instances. Uh, and this is true in expectation and almost surely. All right. <clears throat> and in addition, uh, the algorithm is scale free. So that's uh, very important. So uh, for the experiment, we took uh, dimension two uh, and uh, K arms uh, placed on the, on, the, on the circle, the unit circle. And um, we compare our algorithms to RACH, the state of the art algorithm uh, from uh, New Rips 2019 and an Oracle algorithm that was uh, proposed by Soar et al, uh, where they, they 
assume that the best allocation is known at the beginning. Um, and here are the results. The two first, uh, the four first columns correspond to our algorithm. Uh, and we have the mean sample complexity here. And you see that we are really uh, <clears throat> outperforming the state of the art al algorithm, but also the Oracle. Uh, it might be surprising at first because the Oracle knows W star, so you just have to follow W star. But actually, uh, the allocation is one component of the algorithm. Another component is the stopping rule. And so if you are not optimal for the stopping rule, you won't be optimal in terms of sample complexity. And this is why the Oracle proposed by uh, Soar, Munoz, and Lazaric are not, uh, yet is, uh, is worse than our algorithm. Okay, uh, I will uh, skip uh, linear bandit with continuous set of arms. Uh, the analysis is much more difficult because um, deriving the lower bound is uh, kind of a mess. Uh, solving the max mean uh, problems that we need to solve in the, to derive the, the, the instance specific lower bound is difficult. Nevertheless, we uh, managed to do it and to extract uh, the, the dependence in the dimension and uh, an epsilon and uh, the size of the vector mu. Uh, and uh, we also have an algorithm achieving this, this limit. Okay. I don't have much time now for the second part. <clears throat> Although this might be the, the most uh, interesting part, this is um, about the classical problem of linear system identification. So you have an unknown linear system, xt plus one is equal to a xt plus noise, and you have iid uh, noise. Uh, the noise can be Gaussian uh, with a covariance uh, identity or might be just isotropic with independent coordinates of uh, bounded psi to norm. And the goal is that we observe a trajectory of the system x0 xt and we want to derive an estimator of a. Okay, so the sample complexity for this problem is, is defined as the number of observation tau such that after tau uh, the probability that your estimator is, is uh, epsilon accurate is bigger than one minus delta, okay? So that's the objective. Uh, we want to design an estimator of the, with minimal sample complexity for a given accuracy, confidence, uh, uh, given accuracy and confidence levels, epsilon and delta, okay? And we want to find the minimal sample complexity and its dependence in A. So A, because we want to be instance specific, remember, epsilon delta because the end of the Okay, so uh, system identification is not new, but uh, so you can look at uh, Jung's paper in 76 for the consistency of the classical estimator, like least square estimator. Um, but uh, recently there have been uh, a very uh, along lines of uh, researchers uh, trying to um, look at the finite time analysis of these estimators. Um, <clears throat> so uh, these are the, the, the three most uh, relevant papers to our research. Uh, the first one, I mean, uh, all, uh, all papers do are, not, uh, are not really uh, uh, they, they have partial results. Essentially, the first one is not uh, scale optimal in delta. We don't know the dependence in A. We have the wrong dependence in D. Uh, the second one by Simshovitz et al., uh, it's difficult to interpret. We don't know the dependence in A. It's not explicit. You have to maximize and optimize, uh, you have to optimize and optimize, uh, optimize some parameter to know the dependence. And the paper by Sarkar and Rackling uh, is interesting, but uh, it's completely avoiding the dependence in A and D. So what we want is we want an optimal and explicit dependence in epsilon and delta. And of course, 
we want to be instance specific optimal. So we want an optimal dependency in A. All right, uh, so that's what we did. Um, we use the same technique to derive actually instance specific lower bounds. And so we use a change of measure arguments. And uh, here in this case, we are able to uh, find explicitly the, the, <clears throat> the sample complexity lower bound uh, because the optimization problem that we get when uh, looking at confusing parameters or confusing system A prime is manageable. Okay, so at the end of the day, we prove the following uh, lower bound that is explicit in everything, and that is kind of beautiful. It uh, says that the sample complexity tau of any estimator that is epsilon delta pack locally around A <clears throat> satisfies the following uh, inequality. The smallest eigenvalue of the cumulative gramian of the system. So gamma S uh, of A is the what we call the, the sorry, where is it? Uh, <clears throat> it's here. It's, uh, it's uh, the finite time controllability gramian of the system. So it's, uh, it has a explicit dependence in A. Um, and so the, the lambda mean, the smallest eigenvalue of the cumulative gramian of the system must be bigger than one over two epsilon square log one over delta. We believe that this lower bound is not tight because there is uh, an additional dependence in the dimension that is not here. Actually, we believe that there would be a plus D, uh, an additive term that is plus the dimension. Uh, well, as you see, the, the lower bound is not very explicit because of this uh, lambda mean of the cumulative gramians, but you can uh, derive a looser but explicit lower bound based on this one. Um, and essentially, uh, it's written here. Okay. So if lambda d is the complex eigenvalue of A with the smallest amplitude, then phi are parameterized by this uh, eigenvalue of tau must be bigger than this. And phi is completely explicit, it's given here. So this lower bound is, is valid for stable, unstable, marginally stable systems. All right, uh, what we did after that is to uh, show that the least square estimator actually is instance specific optimum. And as I explained earlier, uh, the analysis really relies on the, um, the analysis of the covariate matrix, the random covariate matrix and its spectrum. And uh, I think this is what the, the most uh, technical part of the analysis. And, and I think that Yassir managed to, to derive a very strong result that the, the, the other researchers were not able to derive. And that's why we were able to show this uh, some uh, instance specific optimality of the ordinary least square estimator. Um, so that's the result for the uh, least square estimator performance. Uh, you see that if this condition is valid, then the algorithm is epsilon delta pack. The, the least square estimator is epsilon delta pack. And this is almost what we have in the lower bound, except for this additional D that I was mentioning earlier. Okay, so this result was, was actually conjectured by Simshovitz, Mania, to Jordan and Resch in their paper. Um, but what, what was possible to do is, is to prove it using a concentration result on the covariance matrix. Okay, uh, yeah. So this concentration result is about the spectrum of the covariance matrix. And uh, so the covariance matrix is X. And uh, we can prove that all the singular values of X are bounded, upper and lower bounded, by, uh, <clears throat> by some terms that involve the spectrum of the matrix M that is exactly the cumulative uh, gramian of the system. And this uh, inequality holds with very high probability. That's a concentration result for the spectrum of the covariate matrix. 
Okay, this uh, plot illustrates this concentration. Uh, we uh, remark that uh, the, this matrix M scale as one over square root of T. I mean, all the, all the, all the singular values of this matrix uh, scale as square root of T. And so uh, the spectrum of the covariate matrix should also be around square root of T. And this is what we, sh we have for the largest and minimum singular value of the covariate matrix when renormalized by square root of T. Okay, I, won't, I will stop here. Uh, if you are interested in the, in the proof, we can discuss that. Uh, it's essentially uh, a mix of, uh, it, it's, uh, it's uh, using the fact that the, the matrix uh, XM is, is, looks like very much like an isometry uh, with very high probability. All right. So uh, to conclude, I would say that I hope that you are uh, convinced now that there are still interest in linear models, uh, linear models in terms of rewards or dynamics, and you have very challenging questions there. Actually, there, there have been a, a very intense research activity around, around linear model recently uh, using non-asymptotic approach or concentration approach. Uh, I showed that you can be uh, instance specific uh, in this kind of, uh, in the analysis of these linear models. So we have an instance specific optimal best action, best arm identification or best system identification. I think this is the first time uh, you have this. And uh, what is interesting mathematically is that at the core of the analysis, uh, we have to analyze random matrices that are built from uh, syst dynamical systems. And, and these are very, very interesting uh, topic in general. All right, thank you for your attention. And thank you again for the invitation. Thanks a lot for an excellent talk. Let me just read out a few questions which have appeared in the chat box. Yeah. So first one is uh, from Sandeep. Is the availability of concentration inequality the main reason to restrict to Gaussian variables with arm independent variance? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, the, the, main, the, the main component uh, of, the, <coughs> of the analysis are concentration of matrices. Uh, so uh, these are a bit, uh, th this, this is where the, the analysis reach uh, its boundary, let's say. And uh, maybe there are, so if you, if you would like to relax these assumptions, you would, you would need actually to, to come up with new um, uh, concentration result for ma ma matrices. Uh, maybe they are, but uh, maybe we are not familiar with all, all the literature on this topic. <clears throat> There's another qu question from Shubhada. Is there literature on linear bandits beyond Gaussian noise distributions? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, okay, uh, let me think about it. So uh, as you saw, when I derived the instance specific lower bound, it was pretty much relying on the fact that uh, we have an explicit expression for Gaussian uh, reward when, we, when it comes to the expected log likelihood ratio. You could have uh, such explicit expression maybe for other di distribution like Bernoulli. Uh, uh, in general, you can derive the, the lower bound, but maybe you cannot have an explicit lower bound. So there is no reason why the, the analysis will not uh, move uh, to, to um, non-Gaussian uh, non uh, reward if they are sub-Gaussian. Now you have seen that in the analysis, uh, the analysis relies on the concentration result for the least square estimators. And again, for this case, uh, it relies on the assumption of uh, Gaussian, uh, Gaussian reward. So now I'm not aware of uh, results uh, of this type. That's a good, uh, good, good idea to, to try to look at, at these problems, yes. <clears throat> There's a question from Devdat Dubashi. Are there similar instance specific lower and upper bounds for regret for linear bandits? 
No, uh, let me think about it. For linear, re uh, for regret in linear bandit, there is, um, so <clears throat> there is a, a, an instance specific regret lower bound and optimal algorithm by uh, Latimor, Shigetsvary and another author. It's the first author. It was an ISTAT paper this year or last year. And essentially it's the same technique. <clears throat> The lower bound you see is exactly the same. Uh, initially, it was it, the technique was used by Lai and Robbins for regret. So there, the the regret lower bound is exactly the same as for it's not exactly the same, but it's, it's similar to that of the sample complexity. And see if you have a, a finite set of arms, then you can have uh, you can have. Uh, problem specific regret lower bound and then achieving algorithm. Now, I, I didn't have time to talk about the continuous arm case, but in the continuous arm case, things are much more difficult. And I'm not aware of any problem specific regret lower bound or upper bound. Uh, there are a few uh, results about linear bandit with so called the margin condition, which means that essentially it's a condition that says that. There is a gap, there is a positive gap between the, the best and the second best arm, or something like that. And it's, uh, th these, are, these are very interesting uh, uh, studies. So there, there, are, there is a literature about linear bandit with regret uh, and instance specific. Yes, there is. So the, the answer was yes. <laughs> Can you give a, a reference to the, what you quoted, the, the, the margin? Paper, which paper is that? Uh, yeah, so I will I will send it to you. Uh, I don't have it. Uh, I don't have it in mind right now, but I will send it to you. Maybe you Thanks. can send it to us, and we can email it to everybody. Uh, so I email to the, the program uh, chair, right? That's right. That's right. Okay, good. I will do that. Yeah. So if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank Professor Kuti again. I'll clap on behalf of everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sandeep, any announcements? Uh, I guess we can maybe start in a couple of minutes. Uh, so Devavrat, the uh, floor is yours. Uh, thanks. Uh, hi, Alex. Hi. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to make sure that... Uh, so maybe we'll, we'll start in uh, three minutes or so. That sounds good, yeah. Three, four. And... Uh, uh, I presume Santosh is not here yet, right? No, he's there. I saw him, yeah. <laughs> okay, so maybe uh, Santosh, if you could hear me, uh, please feel free Hi. to... Yeah, there you are. Hi, there. Hi, good morning. Morning. Uh, Santosh, if, if you want to try to see if your slides can be shared. Yes. So I'll share now. Oh, perfect. We can see it. Excellent. Okay. So maybe Santos, we give uh, one or one and a half more minutes and then get started. Sounds good. Okay. So logistically, uh, Santos, I'll look for uh, questions in the chat. And um, as you're speaking, um, uh, I'll try to interrupt you in the middle and read out the questions. Great. And I should try to finish in 45 minutes uh, from the so start. It's, uh, so at least on the schedule, it's uh, till 15 minutes. But uh, given the, the nature of the things, we do go all the way to the end of the hour. OK. So uh, I, I, will, I will not sort of uh, 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 try to sort of restrict your time too much in <laughs> that <right>. sense. <laughs> <laughs> And then, of course, if questions queue up, uh, I'll also uh, keep some of the questions to the end. OK. Yeah, please do interrupt whenever if you like. Yeah, I'm sure many of you, like myself, uh, uh, I just couldn't sort of uh, uh, grasp the visuals on the national television. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Uh, 
Okay. By the way, uh, uh, you can hear me fine now. I can perfectly hear you fine. Uh, I'm just wondering if I need my headset. Uh, one second. Yeah. If you want to experiment, we can try a couple. No, uh, Santosh, we can't hear you. Do you want to try again? No, I can't hear you. Can you try to say something just to make sure? Oh yeah, I think I think yeah. it's back. I just put it. Yeah, it's, it's back. Maybe it's more Perfect. stable. Okay, so uh, Sandeep, should I get, get us started? Oh, sure. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, uh, our next speaker is uh, Santosh Vampala. Santosh is a distinguished professor at uh, College of Computing at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, his research interests are in the theory of algorithms, uh, tools for sampling, learning, optimization, data analysis, high dimensional geometry, random linear algebra, and lately computation for good. He has received uh, numerous uh, distinguished awards. Uh, just reading out some, uh, Guggenheim Fellow, uh, Raytheon Fellow, ACM Fellow. Uh, he has received uh, a collection of paper prizes. Again, reading out some uh, gem of pods. Uh, and most recently, uh, the 2021 Soda, which is, I think, hot off the press. Uh, so congratulations, Santos. And uh, thank you for agreeing to give a talk here. And floor is all yours. Thank you. Thanks for this. Uh invitation and for a nice uh, collection of talks. Um, the topic of my talk is uh, about the problem of computing the volume uh, of a high dimensional object. Um, and it's, it's an old problem. Uh, I, 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 more than half the talk is background about and previous developments about the problem, but I'll try to also uh, talk about a, a, a recent development uh, uh, towards the, the latter half. Uh, this is joint work with uh, two graduate students, two PhD students here uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, Her Jia and Aditi Ladda, and uh, 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 Tatli, who's a faculty member at the University of Washington. So here's the problem. Um, we have a, a set in high dimensions. Uh, we'll assume it's uh, compact, so it has volume. And the goal is to estimate its volume to within some relative error. Um, so there's no issue of uh, representing the final answer. Um, and now how is this set given to us? Uh, it's specified by some point in the set, you know, some point in the set, which is a little bit deeper in set set. It's not completely uh, on the boundary. Uh, so, it, it, there's a, so we'll make this precise by saying that the, there's a unit ball around uh, a point, which is fully contained in the set. And in addition, uh, the entire set is contained in a ball of uh, radius some capital R. So this capital R and the point X zero are both specified to us. Uh, there's no bound on capital R. I mean, it could be exponentially large and so on. So it takes log of capital R bits to specify it. Now, in addition, you get to query the set as follow, follows. For any point in space, you can ask, is the point in the set? And you get back a yes or no answer. And that's it. That's really the entire interaction with the set. So it's a very general model uh, for various problems in high dimension. And indeed, uh, uh, just about everything that we know how to do in polynomial time, we can do in this uh, rather weak uh, model of interaction. Okay, so here's a first attempt of trying to compute the volume, you know, uh, by from sort of the definition of volume, let's divide it up into little uh, uh, cubes and then uh, count how many of those cubes uh, intersect the set, um, add, add, multiply them by the volume of each cube. And as we make the cube smaller, this should approximate the, the volume arbitrarily close. Now the difficulty of course, is that in uh, n dimensions, the number of cubes will grow exponentially in n. And, and, and we want uh, to know if this problem is polynomial time tractable. So a second attempt would be, well, uh, rather than trying to divide, let's try to sandwich, meaning this red set is the one whose volume we want. Let's try to enclose it uh, between uh, two or, 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 or um, have a simple set inside and outside uh, that's as tight as possible. Now sets for which 
we know how to easily compute the volume include ellipsoids. So, and uh, one could ask, you know, let's, let's try to have the largest ellipsoid that's contained inside and the smallest ellipsoid that contains it, just a scaling of the inner one, in fact. And the best such thing is a classical result of John. And it says that there is always an ellipsoid for any convex body that uh, sandwiches to within a factor of n. And the n is tight for a simplex. Um, there's also a different ellipsoid that achieves the same result, and this will be um, uh, relevant for us. And this is the ellipsoid uh, uh, obtained from um, uh, the covariance matrix. Uh, so the following definition will be useful. We'll say that a distribution is an isotropic position if its mean is zero and its covariance is the identity. And so for a convex body in isotropic position, which means that I've transformed the set so that uh, uh, the mean and covariance are zero and identity respectively. Um, there is always a ball of radius slightly larger than one and, uh, and uh, uh, contained inside it, and a ball of radius uh, slightly larger than square root n, uh, which is, uh, so, sorry, larger than n, which contains it. So it's exactly the same sandwiching ratio. The ratio of these two numbers is still n, uh, but it's a different ellipsoid than the general ellipsoid. Okay. Now, uh, the John ellipsoid is hard to compute exactly, but we can approximate it. So instead of n, you can get into 1.5 in polynomial time. This inertial ellipsoid, uh, we can approximate to any factor we'd like, and we'll see soon. Um, either way, suppose you use the volume of these ellipsoids as your approximation to the volume of the body you're interested in, the factor is still n to the order n, right? Uh, it's, it's a polytime algorithm, but the, the, but the factor went up to n to the order. Previously, it was you know, exponential in n factor and exponential time if you just do divide and conquer. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, uh, in some sense, you cannot do better. This result uh, from the, uh, I guess now, uh, uh, 25 years ago, uh, of uh, Elekesh and refined by Barani and Furedi says that for any deterministic algorithm, that uses at most n to the a queries to this uh, uh, membership in the set k and computes two numbers a and b so that one is a lower bound on the volume and one is an upper bound. There is some convex body for which the ratio that it can find uh, is, is exponentially large. In fact, it's about n over a log n to the n over two. Now in particular, if uh, it's a polynomial algorithm, then a is some constant. So the best possible approximation you can get in polynomial time is n over log n to the power of n over two. So we're almost matching these simple ellipsoidal approximations. Um, in fact, and, yes. And there's a few, few questions. Um, so I'm going to read them out one by one. First is by Sandeep. Uh, does estimating the volume problem relate to estimating the integral of a function over that volume problem? Oh, yes. OK, so indeed, uh, volume is the same as integrating the constant function over a set. Uh, 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 say function one, um, uh, and more generally, the problem of integrating uh, functions in space is, is 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 very interesting, and we will uh, come to that. This is just a uh, well, maybe the most well known special case of that. Perfect. And I think uh, next question of Sandeep was similar, saying that so uh, by solving, I think uh, paraphrasing by solving the uh, volume problem, does it also help you solve the computing integral problem? Great, so the methods will be similar, but the integral problem is indeed more general. And I will remark as we go through these algorithms, uh, uh, what needs to be done to make it uh, work for uh, integration and what functions can be integrated, not all, of course. Yeah. Perfect, all right, thanks. Thank you. Um, so the other hardness result here is by Dyer and Fries, and that says that even for an explicit polytope, so so this this lower bound of uh, uh, bar allocation, bar and Freddy, has to do with uh, constructing sets that might not be very easy to represent in, uh, or have short uh, representations. However, the, 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 the theorem of uh, Dyer and Fries says that even if you give me an explicit polytope, it's sharply hard for, for, for extremely well-structured uh, uh, polytopes uh, to compute the volume. So here is what we have, and this is the summary of the lower bounds. If you, if you give me n to the a or Oracle calls for any a, the lower bound on the approximation is roughly n over log n to the n. If you give me one over epsilon to the n Oracle calls, right, for any epsilon, the lower bound is still one plus epsilon to the n. So 
uh, even if you give me a simple exponential number of Oracle calls, you still have a lower bound that's exponential in N. And this is indeed tight, actually. You can, uh, 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 with, with Daniel Radish, we have a nearly matching upper bound on uh, in deterministic algorithms. Now, in this against this backdrop came the, the striking result of Dyer, Fries, and Cannon uh, that says that there is a polynomial time randomized algorithm that estimates the volume of any convex body to within relative error one plus epsilon. You choose the epsilon with probability at least one minus delta. You can choose the delta. And the time is n one over epsilon, the polynomial in n one over epsilon and log of capital R over delta. Remember capital R is the, is the sanity side. So it's, it's really is a polynomial in the input and uh, in one over epsilon. The dependence on one over epsilon turns out to be necessary as well. Um, the log one over delta is standard for randomized algorithms. And so from now on, I will ignore that. That will be the dependence for all algorithms. Okay, so since then, there's been a lot of progress. And uh, just to, I, I won't go through everything in this slide, but all I'm putting up there is the exponent of the, of the uh, complexity of volume computation. And uh, um, the, perhaps the most interesting thing is, is that every improvement uh, came with some quite general techniques and uh, interesting uh, new mathematics. Um, the last line here, we'll, we'll be talking about in more detail, is for a special class of convex bodies called uh, well-rounded convex bodies, uh, which are um, uh, uh, convex bodies with the property that this capital R is order of square root n. So in other words, uh, but, but it doesn't have to be the entire body, most of the body. So more precisely, we say that a body is well-rounded if it contains a unit ball and is contained in a ball, is mostly contained, let's say half of the body is contained in a ball of radius order of square root n. That's, that's what well-rounded means, and we'll see that again. Um, okay, so uh, let's make one more attempt now that we know that randomization is essential. Um, uh, here's the sort of the, the, the simple uh, grade school algorithm. Let's pick random points from some simple set like a ball or a cube large enough that contains your uh, body K. For example, we are already given that a ball of capital, radi capital R radius contains K. And you compute what fraction of the samples fall in K. Okay, now this times the volume of the outer ball is an estimate of the volume of uh, K and it's uh, correct in expectation. But of course, the problem again is that you need too many samples. Indeed, it's the same sort of reasoning as the lower bounds. The trouble is that for any, any uh, uh, set of, any collection of points, the convex hull, uh, and, in, and, and also for any polytope with not too many facets or not too many vertices, the ratio of the ball containing the polytope to the polytope itself is unfortunately exponentially small. Well, fortunately, unfortunately, it's, ex it's, it's exponentially small. It doesn't matter what the polytope is. The, just the fact that it has either a small number of vertices or a small number of uh, facets directly implies that it's got to be a very small volume compared to the volume of the ball. So this type of approach of using one simple body to, to get uh, at the volume of others, even with sampling, uh, is, is exponentially off. Okay, so, so here's what uh, Dyer, Fries, and, 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 and Cullen did. Uh, it's kind of, so we, we want to estimate the volume of K, which is sandwiched like this. Let's not try to do it in one shot, like on the previous slide. Let's define a sequence of bodies, a sequence of balls, and from those bodies, so that uh, we will estimate uh, uh, in sequence the, the, the volumes of all of these, and eventually the last one will be the volume of the body we're, we're interested in. So more precisely, um, you start with uh, K0 just being uh, the unit ball. That's the, the innermost one here. K0 is just this, this, this one here. And then K1 will be the convex body K intersected with a slightly larger ball, two to the uh, one over N, so about one plus one over N, and then you know two to the two over N and two to the three over N and so on. When I is large enough, when it's about N times log R, then the ball will contain the entire body. So the last body will just be the convex body K. Okay, now why, the, why this sequence? And there's not too many. There's only N times log R total number of bodies in the sequence because it's growing geometrically even if slowly. And then the, 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 the algorithm is simply, you know, uh, 
you start with the volume of the unit ball and multiply by the ratios of all of the volumes along the way. Right? Now, that, that's it. So it's very similar to the, to the simple sampling algorithm, except instead of one shot, we're doing it in, in the sequence. And why the sequence? Well, we have the property that every ratio here is going to be small. Uh, uh, the reason every ratio is going to be small is that we chose the radius of the ball to grow by only one plus one over n. And so then a simple argument shows that the volume cannot be more than twice, not just of the ball, but the ball intersected the body also. Hi, Sandosh, you there? I think we've, we've lost you. Hello. Hi, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know when I got uh, cut off. Uh, uh, I think uh, we lost you at, uh, as you were just getting to the, um, uh, explaining the uh, ratio being no more than two. Okay, great. So, so yes, uh, uh, sorry about. Also, that. we sure. lost your we lost your slide share. Okay, I should do that again. Is it back? Perfect. Thank you. Okay, uh, sorry about that. So the the volume grows by only a factor of two because the 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 ball radius is uh, going up by only uh, about one plus one over n. So the ball volume of course goes up by only a factor of two, but even the ball intersected with the convex body goes up by only a factor of two. And then this is great because, you know, we're trying to estimate something, uh, a quantity who's, which is between half and one. And so using independent samples uh, to get a one plus epsilon approximation, you only need one over epsilon squared samples. And if you need to do this m times and multiply those ratios, since the, everything is independent, this requires m over epsilon squared samples in each phase, m times. So it's about m squared over epsilon squared. And since m is linear in n, n log r, the whole thing is n squared log squared r, basically. And, and this star is going to subsume log factors and dependence on epsilon. So this is assuming that we can sample. Now remember, the sampling problem is not just from a ball anymore. It's from some convex body. And we want to see how much of those, what fraction of those samples fall in a different convex body. This takes us to the sampling problem, which is very interesting on its own, given a, a, a access to a function proportional to a desired uh, uh, density, uh, can you sample from this density? So you were able to ask, so what I, should the density? So I think, uh, Santosh, I, I yes. uh, incorrectly potentially uh, typed answer to your question in uh, one of the earlier questions. So uh -huh. when you were explaining that slide of all exponents, uh, yes. Those exponents primarily were exponents of n. Yes. But, uh, but what happens to the exponent of epsilon? Does it remain same as one over epsilon square or one yes. over epsilon? Sorry. It, it, the, in all of those algorithms, the, the dependence on epsilon is one over epsilon square. In, in all the randomized okay. algorithms, yes, the dependence on epsilon is one over epsilon square. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay, so this is the sampling problem. And uh, the, the state of the art for sampling is that any log concave density can be sampled in polynomial time. And uh, all you need is access to a function that's, pro you know, the, the, so that's proportional to the density. So you should be able to evaluate that at any point. This has many applications uh, besides uh, integration uh, and volume computation. Um, one such application is relevant to this talk is rounding. Uh, this is the idea of estimate, the question of estimating the covariance matrix, the, the mean and the covariance. And the idea, the algorithm is very simple. Just from the definition of mean and covariance, you sample points and as, use the sample mean and sample covariance. That's it. That's the whole algorithm. Uh, and then using the sample covariance, you can estimate the transformation that would make it isotropic, right? The A to the minus one half, if A is your covariance estimate. Now, um, the question is, how accurate is this? Meaning, how many samples do you need? And it was shown uh, in 2009 that uh, in fact, uh, linear in the dimension number of samples suffice. 
uh, the C epsilon here also grows roughly as one over epsilon squared. Uh, and and with, with a linear in, in N uh, number of samples, the estimate of the covariance is close in, uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, operator norm. So it's actually, uh, a, in other words, for every vector V, the variance along that direction is estimated to within one relative error one plus epsilon using only constant depending on epsilon times N random samples. Um, so, so that's another application to figure out this, uh, this uh, ellipsoid that, that, that is the covariance ellipsoid, assuming you can sample. Okay, but how do we sample? And it turns out sampling algorithms are among the simplest uh, algorithms, uh, at least in this setting, uh, uh, in the literature. Uh, in the case of uh, this general, general problem with membership oracles, the, the way, uh, one way to do it is, is the ball walk, which is the following. At a point X in the set, you pick a random point from a, from a ball of fixed radius delta around the set. And then uh, if that new point is in the set, you go there. If not, you just try again. That's it, that's the, that's the whole algorithm, right? It's this rejection sampling. You pick a point in the ball, if it's there in the set, you go there. If not, you try again. It's not hard to see that, the, that this process is symmetric. And therefore for any connected set, the stationary distribution that it will approach or, or, or it will be, will be uh, uniform. Now, the fact that it does approach a stationary distribution and it approaches it quickly is something that takes much more work and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get to that. There are other walks, uh, just one of them called hit and run is quite successful in this general setting. There are many other walks for specialized things like polytopes that I won't get into in the talk. Now, the main question, as I mentioned, is how do we, how many steps of this process do we need? Each step of the ball walk is a one membership query. So it's the number of steps determines the complexity of, 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 of sampling. And for this, um, the, the, the technique is, 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 is bounding the conductance of this underlying Markov chain, which comes down to two uh, geometric uh, properties. One is about what happens in one step. You know, what happens to two the distribution of one step taken from these, from these points? And the other is, uh, is, is, is uh, more geometric in general, it's uh, isoperimetry. And it's the question of what is the smallest possible boundary that a subset of a given measure can have. So I'll talk more about this, but this is the form of the, of the type of isoperimetry inequality. Uh, well, this one is a true inequality, but uh, 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 one of the earlier ones. And uh, we'll, we'll see how, how this has been refined more recently. What does this say? This is saying, suppose I take some partition of your set, let's say in this case, the convex body, uh, K here, into two sub, three subsets, S1, S2, and S3. S1 and S2 are disjoint here as marked here, S1 and S2 are disjoint. And not only are they disjoint, they are uh, at minimum distance D, S1, S2. This means the minimum distance between any two points in S1 and S2. Then you're asking, what's the leftover volume? What's the minimum possible remaining volume? So it scales linearly in the distance, that's maybe uh, intuitive. And with the smaller of these two, that's perhaps also intuitive. Um, but then the factor in front just depends on an absolute constant and the diameter of the set. This capital R is effectively the diameter of the set. So the distance between the sets divided by the diameter of the set times the smaller of the sets. This has to be the case for the minimum volume. Now a set for which this would not be true would be something shaped like this, right? Where the, the, the prob you need a very little cut, small cut to separate these two. And the whole point is that convex bodies of log concave densities, which I haven't defined yet, cannot have this kind of shape. Okay, so this isoperimetry turns out to be crucial. And, and formally, it's exactly what we uh, alluded to in the previous slide. For any subset S, doesn't have to be continuous, just a measurable subset like this. Um, the, the, the isoperimetric ratio is the volume of the set to the boundary into to its internal boundary over all subsets of, of size no more than half. And so it's the maximum possible ratio of this. Now, the, the, the reason this uh, comes up is that it directly bounds the mixing time of the ball walk as shown by Kanan, Lovas and Shimno in 97. In dimension n, the mixing time is n squared times this, this isoperimetric ratio square. So the smaller the isoperimetric ratio, the faster is the ball walk. And then it becomes a good question, natural question, what is the best possible bound 
on this isoperimetric uh, constant, sometimes called the KLS constant. Um, to uh, one way to one nice way to to think about this constant and the bounds that have been proven about it is via via the covariance matrix. So, which is just which I've stated here again. Um, the trace of the covariance matrix is the expected square distance of a random point from, from, the, from the mean. Um, and uh, uh, here is what uh, Karan Lobat and Shimonovich proved about this. They've showed that this uh, uh, isoperimetric ratio, or this constant, is at most uh, an absolute constant times the square root of the trace. And in particular, if the body is isotropic, meaning the covariance is identity, then the trace is n, and so this is order of square root n. As a result, you get a mixing time of n cubed, which is what they proved. Okay. Now they conjectured though, that it only depends on the largest eigenvalue. This is the KLS conjecture, that it depends only on the largest eigenvalue, in which case, uh, uh, you know, the largest eigenvalue in the isotropic case, which means all eigenvalues are one, is order one, and the mixing time is n squared, would be n squared. Um, in a, a few years ago, uh, uh, we refined their bound to show that it's in fact the fourth root of the sum of squares of the eigenvalues, so somewhere in between the two, the conjecture and the theorem, this means n to the one fourth and gives an n to 2.5. A few months ago, uh, Yuan Su Chen proved that for, uh, that in fact the bound can be improved to um, a sub polynomial factor times uh, uh, the square root of the largest eigenvalue. Um, so up to a sub polynomial factor, the conjecture is true. And this gives on the mixing time, a bound of n to the two plus little o one. Okay. So uh, what is the conjecture? The conjecture says that there is no factor there. It's actually just square root of uh, uh, lambda one. And uh, it's very natural because another way to interpret it is that the worst cut, the cut whose area is smallest compared to the volume of the subset is always uh, a half space cut up to a constant factor. So we're saying that half space cuts, just you know, straight uh, hyperplane cuts must be uh, the minimum, the worst possible, up to some universal constant factor. That's the conjecture. So it's it's it's, it's really clean, and and and, and in this in this uh, strong version, it's still open because there's, we have a dependence on the dimensional. Okay, so that's the theorem, and I mentioned already this. Now the second line is important uh, because while sampling is directly related to this isotropic constant, volume turns out to be considerably more difficult, and in particular you know, we'll have to deal with uh, uh, non-isotropic bodies in the course of the volume algorithm. And there, uh, the bound where we have n squared times the trace of the covariance, which is the, the, the bound from Kanan, Lovas, and Shonovitz will be, will be important. And that, that gives n cube, I'm just remind you. Okay, so this completes the analysis of the KLS volume algorithm, which is, you know, n phases, n samples per phase, and n cube queries per, uh, sample giving you n to the five. So this was the status as of 1997. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's the, now how do we go beyond this? Seems quite tight, right? N phases and samples per phase and Q. In fact, you could say you must take N phases because the volume of your initial body and your final body could be, will be in general be off by an exponential factor. And so, you know, how could you decrease by have fewer than fewer than n, n phases. So here's where we go to a more general setting. Rather than a sequence of bodies, let's think about a sequence of functions where uh, our goal is to integrate the last function in the sequence. And the first function in the sequence is something simple, like the constant function over a unit ball or a Gaussian, something like this. And again, we use the same telescoping sequence as the, as the uh, algorithm and estimate each ratio. Now, how do you estimate the ratio of two integrals? Well, we sample a point with density proportional to the, to the function in the denominator. And then our estimator is just the ratio of the densities. So it's the classical statistical method, the ratio of the densities at that point. And its expectation is exactly the ratio of the integrals. Okay, so, so uh, you, you sample a point and you look at the ratio of the densities and, 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 and you sample according to the function in the denominator. And what you get back is the expect, in expectation is the ratio of the integrals. So now the question is, uh, uh, you know, what functions should we use and uh, how, how long will this take? So let's use a function which uh, uh, it looks like this, uh, an exponential in, the, in, the, in, in, in some norm of the, of the current point. 
And uh, it has a coefficient AI, in statistical physics would be an inverse temperature. And uh, it, it, uh, uh, this coefficient starts out very high. So the function is extremely narrow and concentrated, right? It, it looks like some, something like that. Uh, it, it may be almost entirely concentrated in the ball that we know is contained in the body. And at the end, it's something very close to zero. So the, so the function is almost uniform. Okay. If you wanted to sample some other function f, log on gave density, you would stop uh, at the point where this was close to f. So, and, and notice here the important change that we are going to change this parameter, this coefficient, at a rate of one plus one over root n. Not one plus one over n, you know, the two to the one over n, but one plus one over root n. And that means that the number of phases will only be root n times the log factor. And uh, this is still okay. And the, the reason is that even though you're going only root n phases, the variance of this estimator turns out to be a uh, 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 constant. I mean, the, this Chebyshev ratio, the variance is at most a constant times the square of the expectation. So you still need only one over epsilon squared samples in each phase and m over epsilon squared samples for uh, if you're doing m phases. Okay, so uh, this is the, is, is the algorithm we had in uh, 2003. Uh, which uh, basically use root n phases, root n samples per phase, and still the n cube samples per uh, queries per sample giving n to the four. So if you notice here, the total number of samples we're producing in the entire algorithm is only about n. Okay, and, and that uh, appears to be optimal. Um, so now there's an important component that I haven't talked about here in both of these, which is that these algorithms assume that the body that you start with is nearly isotropic meaning its covariance is almost identity. So there's a question here, how do we round? How do we make the, the, the body uh, 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 nearly isotropic? And the algorithm is going to be quite simple. We'll use a sequence of balls. And now we can go, we'll, we'll go faster. We'll double the radius of the ball at each step. And to, to make the next body isotropic, we will sample from the, you know, from, from the next body and, uh, and uh, 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 estimate its, uh, its, uh, its covariance matrix, thereby using the estimate of the covariance, we can make it nearly isotropic and we repeat this. Um, why is it that you can sample from the next body when you jump so much? And this is an important lemma. This is in, 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 the, in, in the paper with Lovas. It is that if uh, uh, the current body Ki is isotropic, then Ki plus one, which is obtained by taking K intersect a ball of twice the radius is well-rounded meaning the trace of the covariance, right, of Ki plus one is order n. That's what we mean by well-rounded. That's what the expectation of x squared is, right? Okay, um, so, so we can't maintain isotropy all through, but given isotropic, the next one is well-rounded. We sample that, make it isotropic. So you, you, you do this, uh, this, 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 this type of sequence isotropic, the next one is well-rounded, make it isotropic, then the next one is well-rounded and you do this. And since we're doubling, we only need a log number of phases. And, but in each phase, you need n samples, each of which costs n cube. Therefore, we take n to the four, which is the same as the volume complexity. So the overall complexity is n to the four. Okay, now how can we so go into this? Further? Yes. So there's a question uh, from okay. Jonathan. Uh, question reads, this reminds me a lot uh, of the ideas of nested sampling used in stats and thermodynamics. Uh, can you please comment? Yes, uh, um, using sequences of distributions for, uh, for, uh, for, for sampling harder distributions or for optimization is, is you know, the simulated annealing or, simulated or, or cooling type of ideas are indeed uh, 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 have been used multiple times. And uh, this is similar to that. The, the, the analysis is perhaps the, 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 the novel aspect here where we have to be careful about uh, the variance of the estimators. Um, this and lemma, this particular, yes, sorry. No, no please, let, I'll let you finish. Yeah, this particular lemma about isotropy implying well-roundedness is, 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 is a bit delicate because um, uh, it is not true that if Ki is isotropic, then Ki plus one is also nearly isotropic. That's not true. So even if, if you scale up your, ball by a factor of two, the next body could be way off from isotropic. However, it remains well-rounded and, 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 and this we can leverage. Uh, but since it's only well-rounded, 
sampling is more expensive. Uh, and ne nevertheless, we can still keep everything under n to the four. Yes. David's question is, how do you make well-rounded body isotropic? Oh, that's, uh, you can make any body isotropic if you can sample it, right? Any convex body. That, that's, the, that's the, just by using uh, order n samples to estimate its covariance. So to use order n samples, estimate the covariance. And once you have the covariance, take the square root and there's your uh, isotropic transformation. Um, the, the, that's for anybody. But the point is that uh, the sampling for well-rounded bodies takes n cubed because you can always, because the trace is small. It's n squared times the trace. Uh, whereas for arbitrary bodies, it could take a really long time. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so here we are. So now the next improvement came in a, with, a, with a Ben Cousins, who was a PhD student uh, at the time. Um, uh, and there, very simple change. Let's we we'll use the same algorithm, but let's uh, use a sequence of Gaussians restricted to the body. Rather than some log concave function or exponentially decaying, let's use a sequence of Gaussians. Same algorithm. Why Gaussian? The reason why Gaussian is that the careless conjecture already holds for Gaussian convex bodies. This is a, it's not hard to prove. Um, we included a proof in the paper. So in fact, it's, it's the dependence, uh, the isoperimetry just depends on the largest eigenvalue, which in this Gaussian setting will turn out to be just one over the st standard deviation of the of the uh, Gaussian that you're using. So as a result, if you're, if you're using, if you're trying to sample a Gaussian of variance sigma squared restricted to convex body, which contains the unit ball, the, 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 the time it takes you will be uh, n squared times the smaller, you know, it's n squared times sigma squared or n squared if sigma squared is less than one, okay? So it only increases, of course, as sigma squared becomes uh, very large, then you expect it to be, start hitting n cube because you know it's all you start getting to almost uniform. But but when sigma squared is small, you actually do gain. Okay, so that's the algorithm. We're still going up by one plus one over root n. How are we going to gain? So so the point is that when sigma squared is small, now the sampling time is only n squared. Okay, and so this part is n cube. But when sigma squared is large, we're going to actually go faster. Rather than one plus one over root n, we'll go by one plus whatever is the current sigma over root n. So it, it, you know, it accelerates. And this accelerated schedule still maintains this property that the variance of the estimator is small. And now let's see what happens. The sampling time is going up, right? It's sigma squared n squared. But the number of phases you need to double is only root n over sigma. Because you're already at sigma, you want to double it, you need root n over sigma phases since, since each time you're doing one plus sigma over root n. Okay, good. And so the number of phases times number of samples per phase times sampling time, your sigma squares all cancel out and you end up with n cube. So the volume algorithm here is n cube, assuming that the convex body is well-rounded. So for a well-rounded body, you get n cube uh, volume. That was the theorem then. But then still the question, if I start with an arbitrary body, how do I uh, make sure it's well-rounded or, uh, right, uh, or isotropic? And uh, this is uh, what has been an open question all along. And the main new result here, I have a few minutes, is that any convex body uh, uh, can be brought into near isotropic position using n cubed times size squared membership queries. Okay, uh, size is the KLS constant. Now the volume of convex body can be computed therefore as a corollary because once it's in, in near isotropic or well-rounded, we know it can be done in n cubed. So, uh, so this is the bottleneck. And, and so therefore the volume of arbitrary convex bodies n cubed size squared. And in fact, uh, the, 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 with the current bound on psi, this is n to the three plus little o one. Then it will become n cubed if somebody proves the KLS index. That's the main result. Um, I, can, uh, I, I, I will describe the algorithm and briefly at least and some of the analysis, but please uh, feel free to interrupt at this point. So um, it, um, yeah. this is, there are no questions in chat that are unanswered, but uh, if folks have questions, please feel free to ask or we can let Santosh continue. Great. Okay, right. so yeah. uh, here's the algorithm. To, to, so, so the goal now is how do you round a body? Meaning I have a body that could be an arbitrarily skewed and I want to make it isotropic, meaning I want to make its covariance uh, identity. Or close to that. 
Um, so the outer loop will be the same as in the in the in the algorithm uh, uh, with, with low s, where we have these phases where we are doubling the ball, and we are just every time we double, we make it uh, isotropic. Double, make it isotropic. Now that 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 part is exactly the same. But previously, to to turn a well-rounded body into an isotropic body, we were taking uh, and 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 uh, and cube step. I'm sorry, uh, n to the four. We were taking n to the four because each sample. You know, we need n samples. Sorry, just to remind you, n samples. And each sample was taking n squared times the trace of the current covariance, which is n cube. So the total was n to the four. Okay. So uh, the number of phases is not a problem. It's only log. The problem is that turning well-rounded to isotropic is the bottleneck. Okay, so how are we going to do that? The way we'll do that is that is the following. I'm, I'm going to state the algorithm here, and then we'll discuss it in detail. So, the naive way to do it is to use n samples each time. Right? Rather, we won't use n samples. So, so when we start out with it's well-rounded, we have a ball of radius one. We're going to use a very few samples, just O tilde r squared, so about r squared times poly log n. And here's the algorithm. We'll sample k points, estimate the covariance. It's, it'll be a very crude estimate. But using this estimate, according to this estimate, we'll figure out what are the uh, 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 large eigenvalues and the small eigenvalues, just based on a threshold. And all the, the subspace of small eigenvalues will scale up, okay? So, uh, and, and then the subspace of large eigenvalues will leave as it is. And then we just repeat this. Okay, uh, let, let, here's the algorithm again. We sample k points from the current body estimate the covariance. Look at the subspace with large eigenvalues and scale up everything orthogonal to it by a factor of two, okay? Uh, uh, as I mentioned already, the naive algorithm would be to estimate the covariance fully, but the, the, the problem is that it takes too many samples, it takes n samples, so you'll be back at n, n to the four. So what we'll do instead is what we're doing is using coarse estimates and getting better and better with not too many rounds. So initially, with, with, with a few samples, we'll only, we'll only be able to estimate the very large eigenvalues, you know, the directions where the body is extremely long. Uh, and then we'll get better and better and better. Okay, why is this better? Well, the reason is this. As we make it more isotropic, sampling will be faster. You can't see this from the trace alone. So we'll need a more refined analysis of the sampling itself for well-rounded bodies, we'll, we'll get there. But the point is going to be roughly this. Uh, there were two previous ways to look at sampling, either based on the largest eigenvalue, which is the isotropic case. So if, as long as all eigenvalues are small, great. Or the trace, which is the sum of all eigenvalues. And if all sum of the sum is small, then you get a different bound, which is off by a factor of n, but still it holds. What we're gonna talk about here is let's look at the distribution of eigenvalues. And as long as you have uh, uh, um, more and more, you know, the uh, spread of the, of the eigenvalues, you'll get faster and faster sampling. That's going to be the the message. So here, here, is the, here is the, in more detail. So we want to find the large directions using a few samples and then scale up the complementary subspace, right? That's the, the point. Find the large directions and everything orthogonal to it will scale up um, and repeat this with more samples. This threshold for what's big will keep the same. We're scaling up so the inner ball is growing, okay? It doesn't matter as long as everything is growing, but the point is the inner ball is growing. The largest directions are not growing. So this ratio is getting better. Um, now, so this, this, uh, the, the, the sampling complexity, the, the one we already know is, is, uh, is depends on the, the, the trace divided by the radius of the ball square and the radius is one, this disappears, but otherwise it's the trace divided by the radius squared. That's the KLS bound. But in fact, you can control it much better. And the theorem is that if the KLS constant is N to the one over P for some P bigger than one, then for any density Q with covariance A, the, the scale is constant and it is in fact the, this, this pth norm of the square root of the pth norm of the eigenvalues. This, this AP is just uh, uh, summation or to the power of P is summation of lambda I of A to the P. That's all this is. Okay. So uh, 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 when, when, when P is one, that's the trace, but we're saying that if the KLS constant is, is better, you get, you get better and better bounds here. Okay, so if this is true, since, the, since we know that in general, the sampling time is N squared times size squared, we get a bound that grows with this norm 
rather than with the trace. And this norm, it will be easier to control as we go along. Okay, or will be, we'll have a better bound when we can control. So here's the plan for the, for the, the, the just an outline of the properties. I, I won't have time to prove these things, but um, the trace, you know, uh, is just going to be whatever is the inner ball times the original trace. Just because we're, we're, we're growing the inner ball. Okay, this norm will grow very mildly. It'll only grow as the radius of the inner ball to the power of two over p, rather than, so you see the trace, there's no p, it's n times r squared, but with, the, with, the, with this norm, it is, there's an r to the two over p, you know, because you're, you're powering up the large eigenvalues, those are not growing. It's only the small ones that you're increasing each time, and we're taking advantage of that in, in this bound. Now, in addition, because you're scaling up, something geometric happens, which is that um, the radius of the largest ball inside is going to almost double each time. It's going to almost double. Um, the last thing is that in order to estimate these large eigenvalues, I need to show you that not too many samples are required, and that will be a, an application of matrix Chernoff bounds. Putting all these together, we get that the, 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 the number of samples, this is again the number of samples. This is the complexity of sampling, n squared times this, this, this new bound here, and that's n cube rj to the two over p. And since rj to the one over p is the, is the, is the psi, we, we get here n cube psi squared. So the bound is n cube psi squared. Okay, so uh, these were outlines of the lemma proofs, but, uh, but I don't think I'll have time for that. Um, this is the lemma. The, the, the first one was the lemma that, um, that the trace, uh, and this, this norm doesn't grow much, this pth norm of the eigenvalues. And uh, the second bound is that the radio, the second lemma is that the, 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 the ball inside grows almost doubles each time. Um, is also an elementary proof. And the last lemma uh, is that the, uh, if you use K samples, this is very general uh, uh, matrix Chernoff bound, that to estimate the covariance, if I only use K samples, then the estimate I'm going to get will be off from the right answer by epsilon A plus uh, polylog factor times the trace of A divided by epsilon K. So you see, uh, and in particular, if I set K to be trace of A, you know, basically polylog, then it's off by a, a fixed uh, additive term. And therefore, you know, in particular, if I use this K value, I can detect eigenvalues larger than say constant times N. And that, that, that's going to be the targeting algorithm. Okay, so this, this last slide, uh, technical slide was going to be about um, uh, uh, how we, you know, the, the isoperimetry itself, and we needed this additional refinement, which doesn't follow from just the KLS bound. Um, and it's, 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 in, it's the following that if, you know, in our paper, improving the KLS bound, we, we showed in fact that the KLS constant is bounded by the Frobenius norm to the one half, which is the summation of the lambda i squares to the one half. Okay, and so the question is, how can this hold more generally? And indeed it does. So if you could prove a better bound on the KLS constant for isotropic bodies, it implies a better bound on the KLS constant in terms of the P norm, right? This, this is this one over two beta for all log concave densities. Okay, so uh, 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 this is the, the conclusion. The complexity is therefore n cubed psi n squared using uh, Chen's uh, uh, exciting bound of uh, uh, subpolynomial, we get that the complexity of rounding volume just as a corollary is now n to the three plus little o one. Um, I'll, I'll stop here with a couple of uh, quick questions, open questions uh, for you, which is, um, um, it continues to be very interesting to determine how true is the KLS conjecture. You know, it may not affect the volume complexity so much at this point, but uh, chances are that any improvements will give us some uh, very nice techniques and understanding. Um, finally, here's a problem that uh, we know much less about. Um, can we estimate the volume of an explicit polytope in deterministic polynomial time? So let's say I want a factor two estimate of the volume of an explicit polytope with integer coefficients and all of that. It's sharply hard, but I just want a factor two estimate. And so even for this problem, the best known algorithms uh, proceed with sampling and, and, and use a lot of randomness. And so the question is, can we do better? Thank you. Thank you, Santosh. Um, uh, there are, while people sort of uh, type their questions,
questions in the chat uh, on the last slide. Uh, maybe I'll ask you a question and get us started. Uh, so here, AX less than or equal to B in the volume. Uh, one um, way to think about uh, the volume in this case is uh, related to, uh, let's say, the partition function for a graphical model that one may de define by thinking of the constraints as effectively the, uh, the factors of the graphical model. And uh, that means that if the structure of the graphical model that is induced by the, uh, the constrained graph that is there, then, and if it's not too bad, for example, tree, then uh, of course we know how to compute partition function. There are other graphs for which also we know how to compute partition function, but definitely that's not something, uh, uh, I mean, I'm trying to sort of understand from your, your perspective, how would sort of that perspective help here, if any? Right. I mean, that is that is kind of using, um, you know, very nice structure in those models to come up with these uh, deterministic uh, uh, sampling or counting algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, uh, right. So the question is whether, you know, one really needs that, you know, uh, of course, one could say, you know, uh, P might equal RP. I mean, maybe randomness mm -hmm. is not necessary. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have Markov chain algorithms in the explicit case, but maybe there is a pseudo random generator. And so everything is, sure. can be done deterministically. But I guess that, that that's sort of a much higher uh, or, or, or more abstract goal. Here, the question is, is there some algorithm that specializes to a polytope? So for, mm -hmm. for, the, for the convex body membership oracle setting, we have lower bounds, mm -hmm. right? So you, you really do need an exponential number of queries for deterministic algorithms. But here it's polytope. So we have to somehow take advantage of the polytopes, just the fact that it's a polytope with not too many, you know, with a polynomial number of facets, inequalities. And uh, so that's saying like, what kind of algorithm could you possibly do? So for example, <laughs> you know, here's something from um, chaos theory that, that, uh, that people mm -hmm. have done, but not necessarily in this setting, which is that you, you pick a direct, you pick, start at some point, pick a direction, and you use the polytope boundaries to bounce off, you know, like a billiards uh, sequence. You just keep going. And then uh, after some time, which again, you can do nothing randomly. It, everything has to be deterministic. Uh, you, 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 wherever you are, you, you, you look at the entire trace of where you've traveled and you treat that, uh, that uh, sequence of points you visited as a sample. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, under some nice conditions, uh, one can show that... Um, for almost any starting point and almost any starting direction, this set of points that you will encounter will be close to uniform in the sense that for any partition of the body, you will get the right distribution. But this is sort of the foundations of chaos. But turning that into algorithms, I mean, that looks like a lot of uh, <laughs> interesting stuff to be done. Yeah. But, but no, I, I don't know if, the, if, the, if, if some of these, um, you know, uh, spatial, uh, DK results can be used uh, here or generalized. That would be very nice. Good. All right. Uh, now we've got a question in chat uh, from Siddharth. Is the N cube bound a natural barrier? Okay, that's it for, for volume computation. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, um, for uh, uh, N, yeah, uh, I, I only have heuristic arguments for that. Uh, uh, we don't have a candidate lower bound construction. Uh, whereas for volume, n squared is uh, likely a lower bound uh, 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 n squared, but not n cube is not clear um, at all. Um, what we do know is that all the sampling processes in this generality, um, the ones, any, all of the ones we know, have an n squared lower bound. You know, the ball walk, hit and run, th these variations all need n squared even to go from one end of the body to another end, another part. But um, whether n cube is a lower bound volume, it'd be great to have some family of bodies and this defined distribution over them to show that any algorithm must make at least n cube queries. You know, this doesn't require any kind of P and P separation, right? This is just a, an Oracle model. So you could have an explicit lower bound using an explicit family of, of convex bodies to show that uh, n cube is a, is a, is, a, is, a, is a low bound, it's possible. But you just um, I would that guess question. that, say again? Uh, sorry to interrupt, Santosh, uh, no, no, no. I'll, I'll let you finish. No, no, that, that, that's really all I was saying, yeah, yeah. 
So, I mean, uh, as you were speaking, uh, a natural question arises, and I'm pretty sure um, folks have already thought about it. So, uh, uh, is that an, uh, a statistical or information theoretic view for uh, maybe number of queries one needs? For example, each query provides you some number of bit of information, and the number of different combinatorial options are, is, are at least these many in the space of uh, different convex bodies. And that means yeah, so that's that's a, you need at least. Right, good. Yeah, I mean, this is the type of lower bounds people have proven in, in you know, restricted models of computation for various things, right? So, yeah. um, um, so you know, you can imagine that uh, you, you look at the, suppose I, I, I define my uh, set of convex bodies somehow. So let's say yeah. all possible uh, rotations of a, of a cube or of, a, of or, or either it's a cube or it's a long, long object mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's a random rotation of this and you just need to determine which one of those two it is, right? Okay. And so how many queries do you need? And so you, you look at the algorithm as starting out with this full distribution of possibilities. Mm -hmm. And when it stops, it stops where the, the, the conditional distribution must have the volume concentrated. Like the probability yeah. that the volume is one or the other is, mu is much more than half. Right? Mm -hmm. And so now you want to say that at each step, the distribution at any level is still quite distributed among the, the, the possibilities. So uh, yeah, uh, it, it's just a abstract proof possibility, not a, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. okay, well, looks like we are at the time and uh, no more questions in chat. So uh, let me clap for everyone and <laughs> everybody can give reactions. Thank you for a lovely talk, Santosh. Thank you. Okay, uh, Sandeep, I think uh, floor is back to you to uh, next set of announcements. Sure, uh, thanks again, Santosh. Uh, uh, the next talk is uh, an hour and a half from now. So it's a good time to have your breakfast if you're on the East or West Coast in the US and uh, dinner if you're here in India and we meet at 10 p.m. IST. Thanks. Bye. Excuse me, sir. Professor Sandeep. Yeah. Sir, this is Gopi from ICDS AV team. Sir, is it okay with the, can we restart the meeting at 9.45? We'll start the meeting. Sure, of course. We'll start at 9.45, but the talk will start at 10, right? Yes, yeah, sir. 10. Yeah, 10 p.m., sir. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. So 9.45, we'll start the host the meeting. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.